I'd love to uh, play a little trivia game with you, ask you, give you a quiz. Where does the United States rank in educational rankings? But I think at this point, you at home, you guys say, well, I mean, we kind of know at this point, right? Poorly. <laughs> I mean, maybe not specifically, but we know below average. More like a mediocre to not so good. Mediocre to not so good. Well, I'll give you specifics and you see if you're adequate. <laughs> These are the numbers that came out today from the Program for International Student Assessment. It ranks these uh, schools or countries across the world according to their education. And these came out uh, for the year 2012. And what you can see there is the United States ranks 24th in reading, 36th in math, and 28th in science. That is, as I said, well below average, below countries like Vietnam who are being tested for the first time this year. First time in the rankings, right ahead of the United States. It's dominated by countries from Asia, Shanghai, Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan, South Korea, you can see there. But it also includes countries like Finland, Estonia, Poland, that are ahead of the United States. Now, like I said, this is not any big surprise to anyone watching or anybody at this table. In fact, I'm happy to welcome Bob Bowden. He is uh, the executive director of Choice Media TV, which is an investigative video website devoted to education reform. You're also the filmmaker behind The Cartel. Uh, Bob, listen, I know we did a little pre-interview with you today. I know exactly some of the things you want to talk about, but I know, first of all, let's just get this out of the way. It's not a surprise, right? We have come to Shocked. almost expect I was, this. Gambling in Casablanca. <laughs> Shocked by the whole thing. Yeah. This is the point. We've come to expect this below average ranking. Yeah, uh, 36th in math, right? We beat Peru, by the way. They came awesome. in last in the, in the world. But, um, yeah, and in fact, the best state in American education is Massachusetts, and even Massachusetts came in tied for 10th in math in the world, behind Estonia and behind Poland, two much less developed economies. So, you know, and, and don't forget the fact that Massachusetts has 54% of the, of the adults have college degrees, which is far lower than both Poland right. and Estonia. So they have natural advantages, and also in the U.S., natural advantages of the state. But yeah, by any measure, we uh, our, you know, we spin the most and do the, the worst well, let's, of let, large industrialized countries. And let, let's do that, because I wanted to acknowledge where we are and we all have come to expect it, but let's talk about the uh, the different ills that people point to as why we come in below average. First of all, I mentioned your movie, The Cartel. I want to play a clip because one of the first things people say is, well, yeah, of course we should spend more money on education. Listen. Should the number one spending state and the number one spending country be paying even more for its schools? Definitely. I mean, the people that go to school are the ones who are going to run this country in the future, so I believe it's really, really important. Really, I think they should spend more on the classrooms, like on okay. the kids and stuff like that. Yes, definite. I work in the school and I know. Clearly, you need to spend more, <laughs> but, but, but let's just point this out. Um, let's put up, I gave you the rankings of where various countries are across the world and how well they perform. Let's put up how much everybody spends on education. Oh, look, there's the United States spending far above all of these other countries. And I don't see any of these Asian countries here on this list uh, spending the most per student. So is it spending? It might work it's if you were paying the kids, if you were literally giving them money to do better in school. There are otherwise. schools that have tried that, by the way, actually. <laughs> like to, really? Yeah, to show uh, up I, the I class. Just, I was trying to be cynical. Yeah, yeah, in places <laughs> with high dropout numbers and stuff. People like to see, well, I, I can give you an example. I, I did, in, when I was at George Washington University, one of my senior thesis I did on uh, D.C. public schools. And D.C. is one of the examples of where they spend the most money per capita for a school system that size, and they have a 40-plus percent dropout rate. What was the problem? Where was all the money going? Well, when the Republicans took over Congress in the 90s, they also set up a, uh, a control board over the Department of Education there to take a look at what was happening. You know what? They had two sets of books. They couldn't figure out how many people worked there. There were dead people collecting checks, the building fund to, you know, to take care of the school's uh, construction and stuff. No, that was being spent on everything else. They had criminals in the school system. So the more money was not the, the problem. It was the teachers' unions and terrible mismanagement. Bureaucracy run amok, and it was hurting our kids' education. Can we throw bad say? parenting in there somewhere, too? Well, sure, that's a whole other issue, but, <laughs> but that's, get, that's, a, that's the example of right there, perfect example, right? Of more money does not equal better results. Uh, look, you have examples in California where one high school, sp they spent over $500 million on a high school that the side of the old M Ambassador Hotel in LA, which is where RFK was assassinated. That location turned into a high school, and basically, just the money, everyone walked out with their pockets shoved full of cash, basically, in that school. If California had won its second, the second round of Race to the Top, the federal competition for education reform, the whole state would have only gotten $700 million. Like that one school would have been more than half of the entire state's Race to the Top grant if it had won. Uh, we showed in the cartel movie uh, a, a, one, a superintendent getting a $700,000 severance. She was running a district with, you know how many high schools in that district? One. One high school district, $700,000 severance for this superintendent. Uh, 
janitors making six figures in American public schools that we that we show in the film. So it's yeah, the, the idea that you can... Uh, How much was that athletic field? I'm a fan of the film. Remember, was there... Like, what, $30 million. $30 million on athletic field. One football field, field exactly. In New and York. isn't that the point? People talk about spending more money on education. They're always under the misconception that means let's pay our teachers more. Mm -hmm. You show in your film, for example, that many schools spend upwards of $400,000 per classroom. Right. But how much of that is actually going to the classroom? That's, that's right. And that's the point that is one that uh, just about nobody argues with. Even the most staunch teachers' union supporter will say, yeah, well, there are a lot of assistance. I mean, compare any charter school administration or any private schools, a uh, number of just administrators and assistant superintendents and curriculum advisors and all these people that every public school system seems to have lots of, and there's just no comparison in so, the amount of overhead. So we, so we can talk about the challenges of bureaucracy and money being wasted in schools, but don't we have to connect the low numbers to some sort of bad outcomes in order for there to be some sort of compelling case to make other substantive changes? And it is one of the problems that America is still a really attractive place for the top performers in some of these other places that you listed, so students in Singapore and Shanghai and Hong Kong, to actually come here after they, you know, gotten their great education, continue to build a robust American economy, which masks the the downplay of this, how do we how do we oh. how do we create a compelling case to change something? Well, that's an interesting point. I, I mean, the, the, I thought you were going for the higher education, basically, in the work. People come here all around the world for our colleges, which of course compete for students, right. unlike K through 12 generally. But uh, yeah, you know, it, it, it's certainly the case that it's certainly the case that. Uh, in, you don't have to look very hard to find obvious dysfunction. The, the masking you're talking about is not the case in Kansas City, Missouri, where 40% of the kids who enter ninth grade finish 12th grade. I mean, there are dropout rates of larger than 50% in, in dozens of major... And that's reflected states. in the city with, like, more cost of services, for higher welfare costs, and, and uh, the, the actual localities where you're going to measure oh, those yeah. problems. The, the follow-on social dysfunctions as a result of those, of those things are statistically obvious. Uh, the, the, the jail population, the drug use, the prostitution, the, the, the lives that do not contribute to the American economy afterwards. I well, think. those are areas where I think we, I, I always, you always expect to see lower income or different socioeconomic backgrounds having worse schools. But what's interesting to me about these studies this study is for us to be that low, people have to be not doing well across the board in suburban schools that's true. as well as city schools. And I feel like that's, that's a big point to pull from here is that it's, it's an across the board and entire flaw in the uh, education system. That's, that's right. one of the arguments that are also used in addition to spending is that America suffers from high rates of poverty. So is that the, the next excuse for well, why we are... China's president? got well, a lot of poverty. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> come on. Poverty, sorry. I mean, exactly. Although the Chinese numbers, you know, you showed the list. It says Shanghai, Shanghai, Shanghai. They were number one in reading uh, math and science. You know, so we, we go out to rural China <laughs> people can't read. Right. I mean, yeah. Let's be it, honest. It's, it's not the it, cities in the world. It, it, it was just the province of Shanghai. It wasn't the whole country. But but still, that and why isn't the rest of the country taking the test? I don't know. But it's also <laughs> a good it, reason why. It, yeah. Right. It's the, they're the, in the they're in the. It's work, worker camps and factories. It's, it's, even the Shanghai numbers are very dubious. Tom Loveless of the Brookings Institution has looked into this and says that he calls it almost meaningless, and I think that's charitable in terms of the description of the Shanghai numbers. So we might dismiss those. But to Ellison's point, is this an indictment of our entire education system? In oh. other words, it's indicting schools mm -hmm. across the in economic the, spectrum. This is an extremely important point that can't be made enough, and in that there are suburban schools all around this country where there isn't crime, and, and maybe a lot, and there aren't maybe a lot of fights and drug use, and the kids have new sneakers and new iPhones, and they, they, it's, you know they're on teams, and everything seems nice, but and therefore the, the parents are misled to think that the kids are getting a world standard education, and indeed they're not. St tests like this show it. In fact, you can go to something called the Global Report Card. You can anyone can Google that right now, and what it does is it compares any district in the United States to a world standard where your district, if it were a country, would show up in the world rankings. And it's an eye-opener to a lot of... Uh, hmm. Well, what about the argument that some people make of, well, we test, because you kind of got at it and in Shanghai, not everyone is being tested. And I know where I went to high school in Georgia, they used to say, Georgia has a state, our SAT scores are lower because everyone in the state takes it and other states don't do that. That's what true. if people apply the same argument here? Do you think that has any validity and uh, that most kids in America are taking these? Generally, when I was early on in the education uh, reform uh, world after my previous many careers. Uh, I, I've started by using SAT. Your, SAT is a poor indicator because there's such differing mm -hmm. rates of, of taking it. These tests, uh, 
uh, allegedly account for demographic. Uh, they, they actually do things in a sort of proper demographic matching to what the country is. Just really quickly, has. though, I think that there's also something to be said about the curriculum, this Common Core stuff, and trying to you know teach politically correct information, revisionist history, not focusing on the basics, arithmetic, reading, you know, basic things like that. I, it's amazing what kids are not learning in school and what they're trying to put into these curriculums. Maybe perhaps that's what's taking away from across the board why kids aren't learning. Well, I'm a Common Core critic, but you can't really, Common Core hasn't really been implemented yet in most, no, but you I can't mean, really blame that for this. That way, and this is the same exact results we had, we had, we've had for years, right? So long before Common Core existed. Math is overrated. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bob, thanks for joining us at the table. Sure, thank you. Coming up next, the Island of Misfits.